Well, what you see, I think, when you have a relationship with a child, your own child in particular, because you can see them most clearly in some real sense, is that you see the manifestation of the image of God. It's, it's not something you treat lightly. It's not something that isn't miraculous. If you take children seriously, and if you take the task of creating a world in which little human beings can turn into healthy, whole, responsible, good adults who can live full, rounded, satisfying lives that are not just good for themselves, but good for the other people around them. When Ideology Meets Reality was a Times of London bestseller in 2021. She is a longtime staff journalist at The Economist, where she has held various senior positions, including Britain editor, international editor, and finance editor. She is currently on leave of absence from The Economist to work with Sex Matters, a new human rights organization. Boys and girls are given personality tests before they hit puberty. There's not a lot of difference in average level of negative emotion experienced. But as soon as girls hit puberty, their proclivity to experience negative emotion so that shame and guilt and disappointment and fear and depression is elevated markedly in contrast to men. Mm -hmm. And it's permanently transformed at puberty and it stays stable for the rest of women's lives. And so women reliably experience more negative emotion than men on average. Now there's wide individual difference and there's some men who experience more negative emotion than women, but we're talking about. And what that means, at least in part, is that the people, almost all the people who experience the highest levels of negative emotion, and that would include self-consciousness and shame, are female. And that kicks in at puberty. That's and so really then interesting. At pu well, at puberty too, kids have to restructure their identities in quite a major way. And that's especially true for girls because they have, first of all, it happens to them earlier, right? So they're less mature when nature comes calling, let's say. Plus, as soon as puberty kicks in, they have these elevated levels of negative emotion. And one of the things we know, this is so interesting as far as I'm concerned, is that if terms that are reminiscent of self-consciousness load almost perfectly onto negative emotion, so there's almost no difference whatsoever between being self-conscious and, and experiencing guilt and shame and anxiety. And so if you add the stress of puberty and that physical transformation to the emotional transformation, and then you take an extreme, the extreme outliers on the negative emotion continua, it's all women, it's all young women. And we know as well from the literature on gender dysphoria that the individuals who experience gender dysphoria, first of all, don't have suicidal ideation or those sorts of symptoms any more highly than people who experience non-gender dysphoria psychiatric disorders. So it's a class of general psychiatric disorder. And if they're associated with negative emotion, that's going to mostly affect young women. That makes such sense. And they turn it onto their own bodies as well. Like the shame and uh, the self-consciousness get turned onto their bodies. And in particular, their breasts. Yeah. It's not, it's not, yes, a, it's not yes. by chance that they're cutting their breasts off. Like you put, yes, you put well, the bad into your breasts and you cut it off. Well, it is, it is this self-consciousness at the body level. It's, it's clear as well from the evolutionary uh, research. So women evaluate men for physical attractiveness and sense of humor and intelligence and so forth, but they also evaluate them on the basis of either social status or perceived capability to gain productive social status. Okay, men do not evaluate women for that but they do evaluate them on the basis of their physical appearance and they look for signs of fecundity and youthfulness. And so women are judged more harshly by each other, by men and by biology itself, let's say, on the basis of their physical appearance. And so they have reason to be more self-conscious. And the reason they're, they experience more negative emotion, as far as I can tell at puberty, I think there's three factors that contribute to that is one is you get physical dimorphism really emerging at puberty because boys get to be bigger than girls. And so that means if girls engage in physical combat with males, they're more likely to be hurt and hurt badly. 
And so they should be more afraid in those encounters, and they are. And then women are also more sexually vulnerable than men because they bear the burden of, of pregnancy and childbirth. And then also, and this is worth thinking about as far as I can tell, is that there's no reason to assume that women's nervous systems are adapted to make women comfortable. They might be adapted to make women hypersensitive to the sensitivity of infants. And that'll make women more tuned to environmental dangers. And the cost of that is that women suffer more emotionally. So you could, you could imagine that the female nervous system might be optimally tuned for the mother-infant dyad and not for the mother herself. And so, and then if you add to that the fact that all of those factors tend to make women experience more negative emotion than men, and then that girls run into that young when they hit puberty, then they're casting about for an explanation for that misery. And if that's provided for them, to them, by the context, then they can be susceptible to emotional contagion any, and, and social contagion. Anything that's associated with explanation for the negative emotion or any way out of it, like anorexia, like cutting, like body dysmorphia, they're gonna be more susceptible to that sociological, to those sociological fads. Whatever is offered to them, and I would say about the, the transsocial contagion in particular, is it's sold as a 100% immediate solution. Like nobody tells an anorexic girl that we can just switch the anorexia off, but they do say to kids, if, you, if you're gender dysphoric, if you transition, magically you'll be better, and that all your problems will be solved because your problems stem from not understanding that you're actually really a boy. And one other thing I would add, I'd be interested to hear if this resonates with you, Something that feminists have um, lamented really for decades is the way that unlike men, there's not very much age solidarity among women. So a young man may look at a middle-aged man or even an older man and say, that's what I'd like to be like. Whereas younger women, I've noticed this really personally, tend to almost despise uh, women past the menopause. And I think a lot of what they're saying is that they don't want to become that person, that women don't want to become their mothers. Younger women are lied to almost all the time. And they're lied to partly by older women. I'm not gonna put this on older women right, because it's complicated, but you know, younger women are told in no uncertain terms that the only important thing for them and what will be vital to their identity and what should be vital to their identity if they're decent and honorable and ambitious young women is their career. And that's simply not true for most women. And it's also not true for most men, by the way. It's definitely true for a subset of men. But for most women, the optimal life, and I think most women discover this in their 30s, is a well-balanced aggregation of family, marriage, and career. And I'll tell you, every time I've made that comment, people have clipped out, say, three minutes of me talking about that idea. Um, I get the most vitriolic comments that I've ever got when I've ever discussed anything, and all of them come from young women. And they're so vicious that it's beyond, it's actually beyond belief. And so that's an echo of what, and then, well, then the other thing is our entire culture has turned viciously against motherhood. You know, we, we presume that if you're a moral agent, then you shouldn't bring any more rapacious human beings to expand the cancerous growth of humanity onto the planet, and that if you're a woman who wants to be a mother, then you're a second-rate citizen because you've subordinated your proper desire to have a career in the patriarchal world to this anachronistic birth machine mechanism that you don't want to be destined to. And all of that is pathological beyond comprehension, but it's also the situation that we happen to be in right now. Young women don't like the thought that they're going to turn into older women. I mean, I remember, I was a young woman once. I think, too, you know, that to the degree that we devalue family and, and continuity between generations, that also leaves the vital role of older women somewhat up in the air because uh, one of the major roles that older women can play is, the, is as wise guides to younger women making their way through the complexities of career and family, and also to play out the role of supportive grandparent and to be there within that family context. And